Hello, friends, and welcome to the uh, podcast um, talking about music and uh, talking about records I like, and I also talk about musicians I like. Um, there's a musician who um, who we sadly lost a while back, who may not have been as well known as I wasn't as well known as I feel like he should have been. He is well known within sort of musician circles and certain you know a certain type of music fan who was into his bands and his kind of music. It's a it was a, a sort of parallel kind of music that was running through the eighties that um, in the 70s and 80s and into the into the later decades as well. But he was in a band called Japan with uh, David Sylvian and those guys. And, he, and I'm talking about the bass player, a guy named Mick Karn, who um, played bass in that band. He played uh, electric bass. And a lot of people think that in the later days of Japan and the David Sylvian thing, that it was a more of an electronic band, and it really does kind of have some electronica type stuff. But uh, their album, I think this is a, a great album. There's an album by Japan called Tin Drum that has um, some really great songs on here. You know, Ghosts and uh, I, it's electronic feeling album, and the there is um, you know some analog instruments on here. Most notably, I think, the electric bass uh, played by, by Mick Karn. And uh, interestingly, he played a bass that is, it, you may have seen, I mean, if you're a musician, you already know all this. So, um, But if you're, if you're just listening to the music, and you're listening to Japan, and you're listening to other things that Mick Karn was involved with, there's a tonality to his bass. There's a strange um, sense, of, uh, sense of fluidity to the way it sounds and the way he plays. And it's because he played, it partly because he was an incredible bass player and played the right notes at the right time, but it's also because he played, a, the type of bass he played was is called a fretless bass. And that means it does not have frets. If you look at um, that bass guitar right there and you look at the neck of it, you can see these lines on there. There's like pieces of metal. And when you play the notes, it makes you hit the right note. When you play around here, the string hits that fret and it plays that note. But if you take away the frets, the fingerboard on there is smooth. And so you can go, mm, you can slide up and down. You have to play with a bit more precision because the fret is not there to hit you that note, to hit that note for you when you push the string down on the fret. Since it's not there, you have to make sure your finger hits the right spot to to make that note. So you have to be a little bit more proficient. You have to really be paying attention. And sometimes you hit the note and you have to slide to it a little bit or you pull it a little bit. You, you know, you do a, a little bend and you reach that note. And those things are what give the fretless bass its characteristic sound and also there's a, there's a bit of interestingness with the resonance to without frets um another another notable fretless bass player is jaco pastorius who if you're if you go back into some you know Joni mitchell and things like that and and his own solo albums you can get a, a real heavy dose of some amazing fretless bass playing i mean he's the kind of musician that you listen to him and if you're a bass player you're you know you just want to throw your bass in the garbage and get another kind of job. But uh, Mick Karn is one of those guys too. Um, I, I really like the way Mick Karn plays. And in the band Japan, he was definitely part of the band. The other members of the band contributed so much. You've got David Sylvian's strange haunting voice. And you've got these sort of uh, multi-rhythms and interesting uh, rhythm programming uh, by the other band members that are that were very carefully worked out compared to some other bands who use drum machines who may have just used the preset sounds and you listen to it and it may sound dated because it's a you know it's a certain kind of a drum machine like a lin drum or something and it has that snare sound that you know you know what I'm talking about um, listen to some you know Cocteau Twins or something and you can hear that snare drum and and you know Human League or something and you're like, oh, that sounds so 80s. But when you listen to Japan, 
the rhythms in there, the rhythm programming, they were using different samples. I think they were programming their own. They were, they were, you know, next level kind of, uh, pop, pop engineer types. And, um, so they had their own sound, which, which is interesting because it makes them sound less dated than a lot of other bands that were using electronics in the eighties. And plus they had that really interesting combination of the precision of drum machine programming and electronic sequencer, you know, like electric, like electronic, uh, pop. I don't know. Electronica is a word for it, but it's not really that it's music that's done a lot with synthesizers and sequencers and drum machines. And it's all very tightly programmed. Everything hits right on the beat, or you can dial in a little swing, but it has a very precision sound to it. And what's interesting with Japan is that on top of that, you had this organic flowing bass guitar sound that Mick Karn was adding to this band, which really grounded the band in a cool organic in a, in a cool organic way that makes it sound like, okay, there's are human beings playing this music. It's not just, you know, people pressing buttons and programming and, and turning on the sequencer and then turning on this sequencer. There's a guy playing notes with his fingers on the fretboard of a bass and, and, he, and it really comes through. And I think it, I think my favorite aspect of Japan is the bass playing and, uh, and David Sylvian's vibe, his songwriting and his, um, general haunting persona that he brings to the band. So Mick Karn also worked with some other people. He, um, he was, you know, beloved in the circles and, uh, and there's a, there's a band called Bauhaus that uh, I'm sure we all know about. And the singer of that band, Peter Murphy, Peter Murphy and Mick Karn got together and created a kind of a super group type of thing where, you know, the two of them, got together with some other people, but it was primarily just the two of them um, being promoted as a band called Dali's Car. And um, there's another Dali's Car album that has a Maxfield Parish cover, but I'm going to show this one, which is uh, which is like a single, but it's got pictures of them. There's, there's Mick Karn, there's Peter Murphy. Um, the album, the work that they did together, they did. They didn't really do a whole lot of work together. I think they maybe had a little struggle with their personalities together, working together. I've read a few things that were like, you know, so and so wasn't taking it seriously enough. I would show up and he wouldn't show up, or I, he was always late or whatever. You know, those kind of things where you you kind of get a feel like, okay, he's not as into it as I am. I'm doing all the work and he's just coming in and doing a little bit and then leaving and I have to do the rest of the engineer, you know, those kind of issues. So, but anyway, we do have some excellent recordings. Uh, Peter Murphy's voice is really interesting with Mick Karn's bass and the type of, um, the type of arrangements and sounds and the interesting scales that they were using kind of has a, a, a flavor to it of um, not really English or American. You know, you feel like you're listening to music, to music that's inspired by like Middle Eastern music or other scales or some Asian scales and uh, things like that. It's really quite good. I, I love Dali's car. It's worth searching for. It's not like super super available everywhere, but there's a, um, there's an album and then there's some singles. There's some, some other sides on some of the singles that have, you know, things that weren't on the album. There's a little bit of way, there's a little bit of searching to do to find all of Dolly's car, uh, material. But then Mick Karn also did some really excellent solo albums. And if you like Mick Karn's bass playing on Japan and Dolly's car, you're really going to love his solo albums because it's it's like all Mick Karn all day on the whole album and he played uh he played some you know wind instruments he, I think he played uh I, I don't know, like flugelhorn or something like that. I think he played some horns oboes things like that um orchestral type instruments um he also did some arrangements and my f favorite of his solo albums is called Titles um it's a it's a um it's it's a great collection of songs that are definitely in his style. There's a ton of of great fretless bass on here, some really interesting choices like note choices. Um 
if you're a bass player, a lot of times you want to hold down this this driving backbeat with the drummer. You're kind of watching his foot and what he's playing on the uh, bass drum. And you, if when you're in a band, I played in bands for years, and I, I was a bass player most of the time, and uh, guitar player some of the time. But a bass, when I was a bass player, one of the things I always had to do, and you really have to do it, is lock in with the drummer, and Mick Karn really locks in with the drummer, but sometimes in ways that you don't expect. I mean, he's not playing always on the downbeat. You know, he's playing on some other other rhythms within the uh, structure of the beat, of the rhythm. And he's playing notes and scale, like um, interesting scales that you might not expect for, um, you know, rock and roll music. If that's what you can call it, I don't know. It's hard to hard to say, but um, the instrumentation is interesting on here. There's there's um, these moody kind of horns and uh, great rhythms, great uh, great uh, beats and time signatures and uh, and that bass, that uh, <laughs> that awesome Mick Karn fretless bass. Um, give him a listen, and you'll know what I'm talking about as far as the um, the choices, the note choices. Um, a, a regular bass player like me would probably go do, 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 and he would go, you know, you know, and play something completely like, where did that come from? And I love it. And he plays in a way that sometimes he'll do loops and, and you'll hear these loops and sometimes rhythmic loops, like with, um, with uh, these sort of tribal sounding beats and uh, interesting uh, percussion instruments that aren't just bass, drum, and hi-hat kick, you know, uh, snare or whatever. They're, um, they sound like maybe uh, different drums from different cultures and things like that and different uh, percussive elements. And then he'll take those recordings, it sounds like to me, and loop loop them and then play something on top of that 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 goes sort of against that loop. I don't know. It's hard to explain unless you really listen to it and and uh, and get into and get into the style of music that he plays. It's not like, it's not like you know pop or rock, and yet there are elements of pop and rock. It's extremely listenable, and there's some catchy riffs on there, some cool lyrics and singing. Um, he does his singing on the solo albums, and he's really good. You know, he does it does all of it and unfortunately he's not around anymore i really miss a new you know having a new mick karn album or collaboration to look forward to but anyway that's my overview it's a brief i could go on and on about this guy but there's that's a brief overview of one of my favorite um musicians one of my favorite bass players uh a guy named mick karn um certainly worth uh exploring you can find some videos on YouTube of him playing in Japan and uh, and some of his other things. I'm not sure if there's much out there to be found uh, of Dolly's car, but there probably is. Um, check it out. Look it up. Um, thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.